Welcome to the interval and Long Now. I'm Alexander Rose, the executive director here at Long Now. And um, I'm so happy to be doing this event tonight. And as some of you may know, we're also doing another event tomorrow where the actual piece uh, that we took up the mountain will be uh, at Gallery 308. And we'll be able to have 250 of you there if you want to come to that. And off the grid will be uh, doing their food trucks outside, which is also an awesome uh, uh, thing to do in Fort Mason. So please do join us for that if you would like. Uh, this is also the very first uh, kind of pilot of a fellowship program that we are working on for the future uh, with Long Now. And we've spent the last 25, 26 years in a way bringing people to us to talk out towards you but the next 25 years, we're trying to find people in their own communities that are doing very interesting work in long-term thinking that can create their own spaces and their own communities and do that. And so this is the very first version of that. And uh, when, I think it was a Twitter connection that got made uh, between uh, our speaker tonight and Stuart about a quote that he had. And when we started talking about it, I said, well, you know, we have this mountain that has some of the oldest trees in the world on it. And this would be a really amazing quote to bring up there. And so the culmination of that was this project that we were able to do uh, with Alicia. And it was very uh, challenging in terms of logistics. It's an 11,000 foot mountain uh, with a very difficult four-wheel drive road uh, that was very weather dependent. It's very delicate neon, all of those things. And it all kind of came together and was one of the most amazing uh, days that we have ever had on this mountain. So with that, please join us, Alicia Eggert. Thank you so much, Sander, and thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to say that this is such a huge honor um, because I've been a like a like a fan of this organization for so long. Um, I can't believe I am speaking to some of the people in this room. So, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so as a conceptual artist, I have always gravitated to language as a material. I like to think I sculpt words the way that other sculptors work with wood or stone. Um, and the reason I like to use language and give words tangible physical forms in space is because I believe we might be able to understand an idea more fully if we can experience it physically. Not only do I use language to express meaning, I also take advantage of the way that meaning can be embedded in a material and the way that each material I work with has its own duration or lifespan. Um, and I explore everything from cut flowers to welded steel, which is a much more kind of traditional sculpture material. And meaning is also embedded in the processes I choose to use. So for instance, sculpting additively is much different than sculpting subtractively. And in this example, the word future, because it's removed from a larger form, becomes a negative space or a void. I also love the way that viewing sculpture is a very embodied experience. Um, the work inhabits your physical space and you can walk around it and see it from multiple perspectives. And your individual perspective as a viewer really matters, actually. Um, it helps to shape the work's meaning. And um, in this case, it you know, determines the way you see the future. Because my work is text-based, I'm naturally drawn to using the materials and strategies that are often used in commercial signage. So I'm inspired by all kinds of signs, um, including road signs and like reflective vinyl and the colors that are used in those. Um, and I'm drawn to the material and the medium of neon for all the obvious reasons. You know, nothing compares to that quality of light emitted by electrified gases that are trapped in a 
you know, glass tube. Um, but neon is also actually very sculptural. Um, the glass tubes are heated and bent over a flame, and they're often bent back on themselves in order to create a specific shape. But my favorite thing about neon signs is animating them and the way it allows me to bring them to life, literally. And the flashing is obviously designed to sort of grab your attention, but I also like to use it to create a specific rhythm in the work. Um, the pace is intentionally slow enough so that you can read the work's messages, um, but it's also fast enough to hold your attention and keep you present and also make you aware of time's passing. Um, it's similar for me to like the rhythm of breath uh, in mindfulness meditation. My desire to give time a tangible physical form um, actually started with this project that I did in graduate school. I called it the length of now. And when I did a Google search of that term is when I discovered the Long Now Foundation and became a member. I think it was like 2008, right? Um, but this project involved cutting pieces of red yarn to really specific lengths and then soaking them in water and then freezing them into the shape of the word now and then taking them out of the freezer and hanging them on a nail on a wall and then allowing them to melt. Um, and I made videos of those nows melting because um, each one was unique, right? And I projected a video, uh, my favorite video, onto the wall with a clock um, in order to juxtapose our lived experience of time with our perception of time and also with that sort of measured mechanical clock time. And this video of now that I chose really highlighted for me how our awareness of time passing is linked to our perception of motion. So there were long moments where the word appears static and change is like pretty imperceptible and time feels slow and really stretched. And then when you begin to perceive the motion, you have this heightened sense of anticipation of something just about to happen. And then in moments of more abrupt change, time seems to speed up, right? And it was interesting also to try to identify at which point the word now was no longer now, but no or nothing at all. Um, my fascination with time uh, probably stems from the fact that my dad was a pastor. So I was raised in church, and I was constantly reminded of the inevitability of my death and the possibility of an eternal afterlife, right? Um, but instead of believing in an afterlife, I ended up becoming an atheist. And I'm much more inclined to believe something the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein said, which is, that eternal life belongs to those that live in the present. Uh, and since the definition of eternity is timelessness, what better material is there to create it than clocks, right? By nature, the motion of clock hands is cyclical and potentially infinite. Um, the hour hand goes around once every, oh, sorry, the minute hand goes around once every hour, and the hour hand goes around once every 12 hours, and it's only then that we see this word eternity. Uh, that video is high speed, you know, time lapse, but when you actually experience this work in person, you perceive it as a static object. So the, you know, the motion of those minute hands is just on the limits of our perception. And in contrast to that sort of cyclical mechanical time, the reality of our lived experience of time is very linear and finite. And I'm drawn to the ways in which we measure that kind of time in our daily lives, like with the height charts that we keep on the walls of our houses when our children are growing up. So this one on the screen is actually inspired by my own son's height chart. Um, he's eight years old now. And last year, I actually asked him, you know, how tall do you think you're going to be when you grow up? And I asked him to point to that spot on the wall. And I drew a line there and I wrote someday. Um, and then the height that he was at that exact moment became now, and then all the moments before and after now are thens, right? <clears throat> and it's interesting to think about how when we're children, we count time up 
But then at a certain point, when we get older, we start to count time down. Um, and time becomes ultimately a reminder of our mortality. Um, and our hearts are like ticking clocks. So this is a sculpture that has an average human lifespan that I called Pulse Machine. And the drum is the heart, and it beats its pulse. And the counter on the wall counts down the number of seconds remaining in the sculpture's lifetime. And it uses those flip digit numerals from old scoreboards um, that remind me of like the ventricles of a heart. And the sculpture is programmed to die when the counter reaches zero. Uh, it's a little bit like Poe's telltale heart, kind of reminding us of the inevitability of death. And some people have told me it's like a little dark or creepy. Um, <laughs> but I actually believe that um, thinking about time more deeply and more regularly uh, encourage us, encourages us to live more meaningfully. You know, it reminds us to focus on more important things instead of more urgent things, you know? And what's more urgent than death? I actually enjoy putting my work in public spaces for this very same reason, um, to give people more opportunities to think about time deeply in their daily lives. Um, public art allows people to encounter art in unexpected situations and in the real world and in real time. And that site-specific experience is very, very different from the experience that you have with art in a gallery or a museum, which are spaces that are typically you know, designed to be outside of time. They sort of pluck objects out of the real world, sometimes unethically, and put them in these boxes that often don't even have windows um, where objects are, you know, preserved for posterity. And a lot of my work as an artist is actually driven by my desire to sort of push back against that expectation that society has of artists to make work that will last forever. Um, and the sense of place afforded by a specific site, I think, provides context for um, the work's message, right? So, and not just in like a static or a singular way, um, the work and its meaning are impacted by continuous changes in the environment, in the light and the atmospheric conditions. The sense of timelessness implied by this word forever um, is, contracted, is contrasted by, you know, our observable time in the landscape. Um, and it was very much inspired by that phrase, on a clear day, you can see forever, right? Um, but I love the way that when fog rolls in, it literally erases everything in sight, you know? And I love that the way our perception of space changes also sort of affects the way we perceive time. Um, and this way of experiencing art, like out in the real world, is not only visual, uh, it engages all of our senses. So in this case, the appearance and disappearance of this word in the fog is coupled with those crashing waves and the birds flying by sometimes and those repetitive blaring fog horns. Um, side note, I did this project in Maine in 2016 um, and it actually only stayed up for about three weeks, um, but I'd love to find a way to bring it here to the Bay Area also. So one of the wonderful things for me about um, light as a medium is the way that it illuminates everything around it, right? So when I place a neon sign in a specific environment, not only does the site impact the work, but the work also impacts the site and it casts its light and the color like on everything it can touch. Um, and in the same way that turning one little word on and off in a sentence can dramatically change what that sentence is communicating, installing the same sign in a very different place can also completely change the way that it's interpreted. So being on a remote island like in the Mediterranean is very different from being on the island of Manhattan. So, I read books for inspiration, um, and uh, I specifically look for books, um, you know, that are written from the perspective of physics or philosophy about the way we understand time. 
And it was just very natural for me to read Stuart's book, The Clock of the Long Now, when I became a member of the Long Now Foundation. And I was captivated by this quote, which if you've never read the book, you should, but it's printed very large in the back of the book. And this was actually a photograph I took of the quote and posted on Instagram many years ago. Um, but the way that I work is when I'm reading, I like have my notebook nearby and I write down the quotes or the ideas that really inspire me. Um, but I sort of put those away and put them to the side. And then it's usually many years later when I'm brainstorming ideas for new work or creating new work for an exhibition that I go back through old sketchbooks and try to look for something that really jumps out to me in that moment um, and feels relevant at that time. So it was actually many, many years later after I read The Clock of Long Now that I uh, went back through old sketchbooks as I was preparing for an exhibition. And I came across the quote and I started to brainstorm ways I could illuminate it and animate it. Um, and in order to ask for Stuart's permission to use it, I decided to tweet this rendering at him. And obviously it's a very initial rendering. The sign ended up looking nothing like this. It was my first attempt at how, how, what it would look like, right? But I tweeted this at Stuart because it's amazing how something like Twitter gives you access to people that you wouldn't normally have access to, right? Um, but I wanna pause real quick at this point in the story and talk about the relationship between possibility and reality. Because another one of Long Now's co-founders, Brian Eno, once said that humans are capable of a unique trick, creating realities by first imagining them. And I really believe this to be true, actually. I also believe that our sense of possibility is directly correlated to our conception of time. So the more expansively we think about the here and now, the larger our sense of possibility. And I'm also interested in the transformation of possibility into reality. When does it switch from you know, only being possible to actually being real? Um, so at this time, when I tweeted at Stuart, you know, the sign was still just in the realm of possibility. Um, and I could imagine it, but it was very possible that he would say no, or he would just ignore me altogether, right? <laughs> um, but if you know Stuart, you probably know that I didn't even need to ask for his blessing because he gives it freely. So as you can see here, he ended up tweeting back at me just a few minutes later, literally, and he said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the first edition of this present moment that I made for an exhibition I had in Portugal in 2019. And as you can see, the design changed dramatically from my initial rendering. Um, because at some point I realized I could turn off those two words, present and unimaginable, and I could reveal another kind of complete statement. This moment used to be the future. And when I realized that, I knew I had to align all the text on the left-hand side so that when those words disappeared, there wasn't like a gaping hole, right, in the design. And the color pink was also a very deliberate choice. Um, I take color very seriously. And um, I chose pink at that time in 2019 because of the ripple effects that the Me Too movement was having on the world. And I personally was trying to imagine what the world would look like if it was more equitable and more safer for women and girls. And I also wanted to imagine, you know, a future where the color pink wasn't always just associated with women and girls. Um, and it's crazy to think back on this time because here we are three years later, I never could have imagined that we'd be living in a post row world, right? Um, but after sharing that uh, finished work with Stuart, again on Twitter, <laughs> I found out that this quote actually is co-authored um, with uh, Stuart's friend and poet, Gary Snyder, who wrote this epigram and shared it with Stuart, inspiring him to write the quote that inspired me. Um, so I really love this backstory, um, and it's beautiful for me to see how this sentiment has evolved over time and how I am now a part of that evolution. 
But I make three editions of each neon sign um, uh, so that I can share them with more people in the world and actually put them more places in the world. And uh, later that same year, I made a second edition that ended up being acquired by the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery. And uh, around that same time, I started having conversations with Xander, as he said, about where in the world we could bring this sign that would be a meaningful place to the organization. And it was around that time that I learned about this property on Mount Washington in Nevada and the fact that it's the home to some of the, Earl, some of the world's longest living trees, the bristlecone pines, some of which have lived over 5,000 years. Um, so in the fall of 2021, I actually had the opportunity to do a site visit with a small group of people from Long Now and, uh, you know, drive trucks up to the top of the mountain and actually experience those bristlecone pines in person and to learn more about them and to start to conceive of like how bringing a neon sign to that remote location might be possible. So um, that process of actually imagining what we were about to do and then making it a reality took about a year. Um, and it involved making a third edition of the neon sign with my studio assistant, Jess Green, in my studio in Dallas, Texas. Um, and I made this sign specifically for this opportunity. So um, the, the scale of it and also the way that it's constructed in modular components so that it can easily assemble and disassemble. Um, so here you can see it in the back of a pickup or sorry, a moving truck. Um, and the sign structure is made of steel, right? And all of the glass components are stored in that wood crate. And I just wanna take a second to acknowledge the fact that we used glass for this specific project because it's kind of insane, <laughs> honestly. Um, and the most insane part about it is that I didn't make any backups. <laughs> so we only had one piece of glass for each part of the sign. And if any of them broke along the way, um, we would have been screwed. But we probably would have found ways of making it still happen. But that material materiality of glass was actually a really important part of this project for me, um, because I think it really speaks to that fragility of like possibility reality relationships, right? And it's interesting to think about when, you know, the culmination of an idea draws nearer and we could, we've been planning for a year and we can now really imagine what this sign is going to look on this, what it's going to look like on this mountaintop. But the closer we got to actually making that a reality, the more fragile that sense of possibility actually became because one broken letter could have like totally made it potentially impossible. Um, and one of the most significant challenges, as you can see here, was getting the glass up this mountain safely up to 11,000 feet. Um, it's so interesting to learn about the bristlecone pines and the fact that they actually thrive in these really extreme conditions that you can only find at these, you know, really high elevations. Um, so it was really interesting to try to make that journey up to this place where they live. Um, and of course, we had to do all these crazy switchbacks and the road was dirt and there was all these huge ruts and every time we went over a bump I was freaking out inside. <laughs> um, but thankfully I was in really good hands um, because it was driven up the mountain in this crazy truck which I learned is owned by Gary. I don't know if he's here. Hi, Gary. <laughs> um, the front of which I think is like an old PG&E truck or something like that, and the back of which is a pickup truck. But it had literally just driven off the playa from Burning Man um, to help me drive up this mountain. And I also had like a whole team of people who were so equipped and like fully, you know, acquainted with installing art projects in really extreme environments. Um, so we arrived at the mountaintop around noon, and after lunch, we immediately got to work assembling the sign structure, and our goal was to have everything set up by sunset. Um, and this video for me really shows how fast that afternoon seemed to go by. 
And I think it's kind of funny because it might be the shortest term project the Long Now Foundation has ever done. <laughs> Um, but as you can see, we did manage to get the sign up and working right before the sunset. And I'm so thankful we did. Um, and another artist and also a uh, Long Now Research Fellow, Jonathan Keats, something that he said about this particular moment was how it allowed us to witness the simulta simultaneity of so many different time scales, right? the flashing on and off of those words every three seconds, um, the sort of beginning of the cycle again every nine seconds, um, coupled with the passing of the clouds overhead, gathering and parting, and then the change of the light as the sun set over the course of about an hour. And then we all know, you know, that's a, a cycle that repeats every day. Um, and all of those things were then juxtaposed with the lifespans, the 5,000 year old, old trees that were surrounding us, right? Um, so it was quite a magical experience. But one thing actually that did not go according to plan um, was that the electronic flasher that I typically use to change the states of those signs, the, every three seconds actually didn't work and we couldn't figure out why. We thought it had something to do with the electricity coming out of the generator, not jiving with it. We couldn't figure it out. So ultimately, I had to plug and unplug these different sections of the neon sign at this power strip. Um, and you can see in this video how determined I was <laughs> to keep that rhythm really consistent. For me, it's so, so, so important that each state of the sign lasts three seconds, not four, not two, three seconds, right? And that um, it repeats over and over and over again, creating that really sort of meditative experience, right? Um, so when you look at this video, uh, imagine me off to the right-hand side of the scene, counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, right? Um, but that sort of meditative and very mechanical rhythm of the sign became kind of like a ticking clock, you know? And that was juxtaposed with our own lived experiences of time and the length of our own human lifespans. So people really love to photograph the sign when it's illuminated, of course, right? Um, but that third state where all the words turn off for three seconds um, is actually really important for me um, because um, from my point of view, it actually returns our attention to the landscape. And this was especially crucial here in this really epic landscape. Right? The Basin and Range province, I actually learned, is home to some of the highest mountain peaks in the contiguous United States. And that elevated perspective is also an important conceptual component of this project. Because I like to think that shift in perspective, that bird's eye view that we get from a mountaintop, as being really similar to that broader perspective of time, right? Seeing that longer now. And you know, yet another time scale we can experience when we look out at that landscape is like the geological time scale and the time it takes for geological forces to stretch the Earth's crust and to form a mountain. So as the sun set, um, the stars began to appear. And I don't know why, but for some reason, this was very unexpected. You know, when you think about putting an Ian sign on the mountain, you think about like the sunset, but I never could have imagined that the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way would literally be right behind it. It was beautiful. Um, and this revealed a whole other time scale, that of galaxies, you know? And I didn't actually know until the other day that our galaxy is spinning, because you know that. <laughs> um, and then it takes about 240 million years to complete one rotation. So here in this one image, we have 
two vastly different time scales, right? A present moment that lasts, depending on how you think of it, three seconds or nine seconds, and one that lasts 240 million years. Um, I also love to think about the way that light travels across space and time, right? And it's traveling across space the same way from the stars as it is from that neon sign. And everything that we're seeing in that present moment is actually an image of the past, right? Um, and light ended up being such a perfect medium for this message for that reason, but also for how, you know, it's a very primal experience to gaze at the stars or to stare into a fire, right? And I feel like this sign had a really kind of similar uh, mood that it created. So what I've always loved about this quote is the way that we can each relate to it like on a very individual level. And when we think about this present moment and how it was once unimaginable, we can think about our current relationships or the kind of current state of our career. Um, but I also love how it can uh, also kind of speak to a more universal level and things that are going, out, going on in the world that you know, affect all of us. Um, and I like to think about how if this present moment was once unimaginable, how it naturally makes you wonder and want to try to imagine you know, what the future will hold. So I personally am trying to imagine a future of gender equality, of equal pay, right? And equal access to abortions. Um, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> but, <laughs> but I wonder what you are all imagining for the future. I think in moments like this, um, which we had sort of gazing out at the world from a mountaintop, or you could have gazing up at the stars at night, or that feeling you get when you're standing in front of a work of art that like really, really moves you. That broader perspective that you get, that bird's eye view, or that feeling of awe, maybe, um, can give you a new way of understanding the world, right? It can give you that shift in perspective and it can help you see the bigger here and the longer now. And the roles that we play in it both individually and also collectively. And I think that that shift in perspective can actually help us imagine otherwise unimaginable futures. And this, was definitely an unimaginable future for me at some point. Um, being able to stand beside Stuart Brand and gaze up at this sign that I made illuminating his words. Um, so I'm really grateful for this experience. I'm also really grateful to all of these people who participated in this project, um, some of whom are not even pictured here. Um, but thank you all for helping make this moment a reality. Okay, so next, um, all of you know that tomorrow there's going to be an exhibition opening, right? Um, in Gallery 308 right here. So tomorrow I'm actually going to be setting up the sign uh, over there. Um, but in addition to actually showing the physical sign, we're also going to be showing uh, two different videos that were created of this project. One which is a shorter exhibition video and one that is a longer um, sort of documentary. Um, and now we're going to sort of debut the exhibition video here for you. Um, and I'm very grateful to Justin and Shannon for their work on this. So. <laughs> So I hope you all enjoy. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I specifically asked for this glass of Prosecco. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, this was it, was, it was such an amazing project to happen over so many years. And then the culmination moment uh, of the actual trip. And raise your hand, the folks that were on this trip. We, yeah, so. We had some amazing people, every single one of them, like doing, <laughs> doing a project like this in the high desert and getting something like this to 11,000 feet. And it was so cold. Um, and it was, it was really amazing, just the team that came together. It was, it, it was kind of one of those strange things where exactly the right people, exactly the right time, um, exactly the right weather. Uh, I mean, it could have been warmer. I would have liked that. But it was at least it wasn't snowing, right? True. And so um, it's. I'm curious. As I mean, you've done uh, many projects in many remote places, and wh where does this fit in the scale of the things that you have done like that? Uh, this was definitely a first for me in many ways in terms of like the actual elevation, um, but it's crazy that 
literally only two weeks later, I took a neon sign up Kilimanjaro. <laughs> so it was almost like a sort of um, a trial run for that other project, which was crazy because this was like a lifelong goal. And then I immediately had to be like, okay, great. That went really well. Now I'm on to this next thing. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the people that came together to make it happen, like Gary with his truck and Trey and Scout and all the other people who were in the caravan up the mountain. I didn't mention that Gary's truck actually broke down along the way too. And we like held this thing together. I don't even know what it was, but it, we held it together with zip ties maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but all those people that were able to come together and make it possible were definitely like a, I think it's a testament to the organization, you know, and the types of people that it attracts. So um, it was just like a magical experience to be a part of that. Um, I see it very much as a collaboration. Yeah, and no, I think that, I mean, our, our goal with the, um, you know, doing something like this fellowship program is to do things that only only we could do yeah. um, with a collaboration like this, where you know, I, you know, very few people have a mountaintop with bristlecone pines on it, <laughs> and uh, very few people ha are doing the kind of work that you're doing. And so the idea that it could come together and be that unique, and you know, we don't want to reproduce other people's fellowship programs. We want to do something that can be uh, only done in this way. So that, mm -hmm. I think this was a kind of a perfect example of that. Um, but I'd love to talk a little bit about your process. You, um, you are a conceptual artist, and you work with all kinds of artisans and other people to create a lot of this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And it's done through a design process. But you're you don't build everything. Correct. Um, and so I'd love to hear you just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, as a conceptual artist, I definitely love participating in the physical process and doing whatever it actually makes sense for me to do. Um, so uh, in this case, um, my assistant Jess and I welded the steel structure and did all of that metal fabrication um, and, of course, the design that led to that. Um, but I do not bend glass. I am not a neon bender. Um, and that's something that at a certain point in my career, it was actually in graduate school, I went to Alfred University for my MFA. And they have a neon uh, program within the art school. And um, I, I was in grad school for two years and I saw that class and I was like, there is no way I'm going to master that craft in this short amount of time, especially with the things that I want to do with the medium. So if I wanted to use it almost like as a, a drawing tool, then maybe it would have made more sense. But because I knew I wanted to create really specific things like letter forms, um, it made more sense for me to actually call upon people who are experts in that craft. And one of those is actually here in this audience. <laughs> Ames, who's here, <laughs> is a neon vendor here in San Francisco. And Ames has helped me with um, a neon sign I had at the Exploratorium about a year ago. But Ames is also going to help with a letter that broke that I discovered today. Um, broke at some point, either in the deinstallation or transportation um, uh, from the Fort Mason back to storage. So, um, so yeah, for me, it's actually, um, it's, it makes the process more enjoyable for me to not be only doing it by myself because, um, I actually feel like that collaboration with other artists and experts in their fields, um, kind of makes the, the project more successful in the end, but it also makes the process sort of like, it makes that final moment something that you can celebrate with like a whole group of people and not just as like sort of this individual. Um, and I feel like it's something that I'm really trying to, um, I think in the art world specifically, we're all used to in music or in film, there's always like credits where everyone who participated in that project is acknowledged. But for some reason in the art world, it's still, we still have this idea that there's this like one sole creative genius behind everything, which is definitely hardly ever the case anymore. So um, it's something I'd like to, to see change, I think. So one of the letters that we're going to show tomorrow is broken right now? Yes. <laughs> yes. And you're going to help us? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Ames is going to fix it in the I morning. Love, I love the, the amount of places we brought these letters, and this is the, this is this the time. between 
the end of that dock in here is where they I now know. are broken. Exactly. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious how the uh, I mean, your your path in this and, and there's something that is so kind of amazingly simple and amazingly profound about these kind of letter art things um, and so it's how did how did it end up uh, that where the Smithsonian acquired this first piece um, that is a really good question. Uh, sometimes like the career trajectory in the art world still totally baffles me. <laughs> Even, you know, at this point in my career, I don't understand how decisions are made like that. Um, but, um, especially since the Renwick gallery that, uh, that branch of the Smithsonian is like a, a craft institution. It's been collecting craft objects in wood, glass, fibers, etc., for 50 years. And I am definitely not a craft artist. So, um, so that is really, I don't I have no idea. Um, but it's a huge honor, obviously. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, honestly, I think that in terms of like the simplicity, the element that you mentioned about my work, um, where that comes from is, um, I have this like really strong desire, I think because I didn't grow up in a family of artists. I grew up um, in like a normal family where they definitely didn't go to art museums or see contemporary art and be like, what? I don't get it, you know? Um, so I, I've always had this desire to make art that everyone can understand at some really kind of basic level. Um, but then I think where my, where I really brainstorm and really um, think about the combination of the language and the material and the process is uh, my goal is to create these layers of meaning that you can sort of peel back um, the longer you kind of spend with the work and think about it um, and think about all of these elements at play. Yeah, I, mean, I have to say, you know, I mean, as we were doing this and then, you know, all the effort and all the logistics of getting this to the top of the mountain and not breaking it and putting it up and, and, you know, it's a set of words, but I think maybe all of you in the room got a sense of that when we saw this video. It's like, it is so much more than a few words. The moment that it was like, I mean, I was crying when it oh. happened. And, uh, and watching the video, I was like crying again. So oh. it was, uh, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting how, how it can be so simple and so powerful at the same time. And it's a credit to the thought that you put into it. Um, I think you, you also told me that sometimes when you go, tra you've traveled with some of these signs that they've broken and then you have to find a local artisan to fix them. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you are on an Island sign, I think is the most well-traveled, uh, piece that I've made. Um, it was actually made in collaboration with, um, a former partner named Mike Fleming. And um, one of our friends at some point was like, you know what? I can't believe you made this work. You were on an island. You get to go to all these islands. Like, I should make something that says you are on a resort. <laughs> 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 but we, d we have, we, we've gotten the opportunity to go to a lot of places because of that sign. And actually, there's like a permanent version of it on the rooftop of a building in St. Petersburg, Russia, of all places. Because it turns out St. Petersburg is a series of islands. Who knew? Um, but, uh, but yeah, what's interesting is, so one of the coolest locations we took you are on an Island was Malta for the Malta arts festival, I think in 2013. And, um, it was there that like, as I'm putting one of the letters up on the sign, I, I think I just like did, I don't know, I tweaked something a little weird. I torqued the glass in a way that it didn't like and just like snapped it. And um, but of course, again, there were no backups. So immediately we were like, okay, so who does neon in Malta, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out there was one neon shop um, in the country uh, and it was run by a family of three generations, a grandfather, a father, and a son that had been doing it for I don't know how long, you know, probably close to how long the medium has even been around. Um, and so we got to go there, you know, bring the broken letter to them so they could use it to make a pattern and make a new one. And um, it was just the coolest experience to meet them and to see their shop 
And then um, I like literally every single neon person I meet is, is so are there some of the nicest people on the planet? So um, it's allowed me to meet some great people for sure. Yeah, I like that idea as a travel principle. Yeah. <laughs> I had a friend who sold a story to a magazine saying he wanted to review all of the best first class airplane things in the world. I was like, <laughs> that was a really good story to sell. Right, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have a question from uh, one of the people who's uh, viewing online, um, Michelle, and she's asking, uh, "What was the, what was the the way that you decided to change the wording? Like, how did that work for you?" Um, I could have shown so many other renderings. I did, like, I showed the one where there's the three lines of text, right, that just kind of like turned on and off in sequence, um, but there were I had already done that one sign um, that says all the light you see is from the past, right? And so I, I had already created that sign, which had a very almost like centered orientation, right? And then the two words on the diagonals turn off and then you read it kind of across the diagonal. Um, and then, of course, I had done the you are on an island where it's up in the one corner um, and it's left hand oriented. Um, so there were actually like many iterations of like how the text could be aligned, which words could turn on and off. Um, and and it like it was it wasn't obvious for some reason that I could turn off those two words. Um, so I was like really thinking about like other ways of animating it. And then it was just sort of an aha moment, I think at a certain point. And then when I tried to figure out how to turn them off without making it look weird is when I discovered that left-hand orientation. Nice, yeah. all right, well, we're gonna open up questions in the audience. Uh, raise your hand and Natasha will bring you a microphone after this question. So James Holm, who's actually, who's uh, our web designer for long now and was on this trip and was very, uh, was helping along the way. He's watching online tonight. Um, but he's asking um, how, you mentioned how critical the three seconds is. Uh, can you say a little bit more about why? Yeah. Um, well, I really felt like when I, uh, I animate things in Photoshop and I use that sort of create a frame animation tool. Um, and so I try out different timings. Um, and it's really about like, I try to read it as if I've never seen the thing before. Like this present moment used to be the unimaginable future. And I try to see like, oh, did it turn off too soon before I got you know, through the whole thing? So for me, it was really about creating enough time for someone to read it, um, but then not lingering too long for them to be like, and, you know, attention <laughs> is lost. Um, so that, like, then almost as soon as they're done reading it, you know, it switches, excuse me. Um, so, so it's a lot of play. And I think for this specific sign, I was kind of always between, like, two and a half and three seconds, and I felt like it was better to give people a little more time than to you know, have not as much. Um, so yeah, that that's the gist of it, I guess. Nice. Yeah. Do we have a question? Anyone have a question for me? Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Xander. Yeah, your uh, big sentence here makes me wonder about different ways in which we could or could hope to complete an alternate sentence. Uh, this present moment will be the blank past. Mm. So maybe that can be the basis of some future art. I love that idea. If you write it, please send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have, that okay. mic is not working. Is that the, oh, okay? All right. Any other questions from the audience? All Elizabeth, and a shout out to Texas. I moved here from Dallas seven years ago. So, um, on time and just think the last couple of years, I wondered as you know, an artist, just you know, what you experienced and how you went inside and any expression during the last two years. We've really been oh. in different spaces. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think the, so I made this present moment in 2019, right? 
when I was in Portugal, I, I think my, my exhibition opening there was in May of 2019. And then I came back to the United States and made the second edition at the end of 2019, maybe September, October. And then, um, and then of course, 2020 happened and everything shut down. And I didn't actually make art at all um, during the lockdown. Um, I live in a part of Texas where everyone has lawns and I had a lawn. So I, my quarantine project was ripping out all my grass and planting like a zero scape yard. And it was amazing uh, to spend time just like with my hands in the dirt. Um, but uh, in 2021, I had an exhibition opening in Dallas. And that was when I made that steel sculpture with the word future removed. Um, so that... I actually titled The Unimaginable Future, still inspired by Stuart's quote, um, but it was very much related to my experience during the pandemic, the way that you know, my calendar was so full and then everything was just whew, wiped, like a slate, clean, right? Um, so actually just like cutting those letters out of the steel, um, and I didn't talk about this in the presentation, but that sculpture is made out of rebar, which, you know, is used to cast different like architectural or infrastructural elements in concrete. And um, uh, the larger sculpture that creates that sort of sense of perspective is actually tied together with wire the same way that they tie um, those kinds of architectural elements together before they cast them. But um, ultimately, like the future is a void <laughs> and this whole sculpture is tied together in such a way that like something like is, was supposed to become of it and then didn't. Um, so that was sort of my response to, to that time. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Stuart to think if he wants to make a comment tonight before we close out. I, I have a couple <laughs> other questions, so I'll give you a moment and you also can say no if you don't want to. Um, but I think that I think what was really interesting, I mean, I mean, that mountain is is wild in many ways and that you pointed out. And one of them to me my, is the the root structure of the of those trees. You can see six inches of erosion of the rock around a living object. So they're like mm. they're more than geologic. Mm. which um, and so then when you you know you and the the place that you chose to put the the sign was a place that actually some of those trees where a fire had come through probably hundreds or possibly a thousand years ago and had those trees were mostly dead but yeah. uh, my favorite comment about bristle cones is that it's not that they live for a very long time it's that they take a very long time to, to die, die. Yeah. and so you'll you'll see a tree that just has one little strip of bark and a couple needles on the end yeah. um, so seeing Seeing that work against that, um, as we also look out across that landscape, was just was very very powerful. Um, but I'm just I'm curious. You you put many works in many landscapes, and like how how did that feel for you? Um, I mean, to be honest, one of the things that kind of compels me to create this work is you know my own struggle to really be present and. Um, like, you know, when everyone else was like around the fire and like enjoying the moment, I was off to the side, like, <laughs> with you know? like so, so I think like I'm still processing it ultimately, you know, like I didn't really get to fully like feel the gravity of it at that time. And I'm, I will process it probably for a for a long time to come, I think. Right. Well, and in the meantime, you took a whole trip to Kil Kilimanjaro. And went know, all the way. exactly. Right. I, took, I did take my turn on the switches with the three hippopotamus <laughs> thing, but let's hear from Stuart real quick. Uh, just a bibliographic note. Um, it, well, it'll probably be Gary Schneider's last book of poetry. The title of the book is This Present Moment, because uh, it really got to him, apparently. And I have to say that the event of that line in the book becoming a piece of art that is worth <laughs> climbing to the top of the mountain to show it against a landscape, I would say it was pretty unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that moment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> 
<laughs> Indeed, and, and and so you're going to be here a little bit. So if other people have questions, um, and and also, so we're gonna uh, we'll we'll break for a moment, uh, and then we're gonna clear the chairs. And please, if you have a glass on the ground or on your chair, pick it up. Uh, <laughs> it makes me very sad when the all the glassware from Japan that we import gets broken <laughs> at this moment. Um, so please do that, and then we'll. But other people will clean up the chairs, and then we're going to screen the longer version of the documentary, uh, not with sound, but with some uh, closed captions. Uh, that's going to be screened as part of the thing tomorrow night as well. Um, but I, and I want to ask. So I, do you have a shot of the Kilimanjaro? Thing. Oh, I think they, I do. so. It was kind of you had to use a different technology than neon in order to hike it all the way up. True, to... I used LED neon for this one, and this is just an iPhone shot. So um, the the shots with a you know DSLR camera will get more of the stars and stuff like that. But um, it was a seven day climb, so we set up the sign at every camp along the way. Um, what was the highest elevation you got to? Uh, 4,600 meters. Meters. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And what's yeah. your next project going to be? Uh, well, I really hope to do more with this. So this, this uh, is inspired by a friend of mine, Satya Brata Dam is his name. And Satya is uh, sort of like a renowned mountain climber. He's climbed all the world's tallest mountains, including Everest, like 12 times or something. Um, but I asked him, like, what kind of state of mind do you have to be to climb a mountain like that? And he said, like, you have to be the mountain. You can't see it as an obstacle. So um, so that's what inspired this. And we hope to – and, you know, that inspired me to think about environmental personhood, um, which is, you know, has has been a way of thinking for indigenous peoples forever, right? To think about elements in the landscape as our kin. Um, but it's something that is kind of gaining traction right now. And recently the, um, the country of New Zealand declared a mountain, a person, a legal person, right? And these things are happening more and more. Um, and so I like to think about um, uh, that sense of personhood of when you're on this mountain. So we hope to take this to more mountains, long story short. <laughs> I, I very much like a mountain being a person than a corporation, which is what we have. But, <laughs> exactly, um, right? <laughs> I want to thank you so much. Thank this you, thank you so much. It's been so amazing. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and here's your long now challenge coin. Oh, thank you so and much. And we'll clean up the chairs and then we'll be around for questions. Thank you. <laughs>